Hello, hello, everyone. We will start in just a minute. Excellent. Welcome to those of you online. Welcome to those of you in the, in the room as well. Bienvenue, konnichiwa, and hi tai, as we say in Okinawa. Before we begin, I would like to thank everyone who has worked on this session, especially our co-hosts, the Permanent Mission of Japan to the United Nations, along with the Science Summit organizers, team members from ELSI at Tokyo Tech, and team members from OIST. My name is Heather Young. I'm the very proud Vice President of Communications and Public Relations at OIST, the Okinawa Institute of Science and Technology, and I'm also the co-chair of the Science Summit for Japan. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us specially appointed Assistant Professor Galina Hinan Hinantigale. Say, yeah. can you say it? Hinantigale. Hinantigale, <laughs> Director <laughs> of Communications and Hello. Lecturer at the Tokyo Institute of Technologies, LC, the Earth Life Science Institute. I have known Galina from his work as a driving force uh, in the Japan SciComm Forum and as an innovative communer, communicator with Elsie. And I have to tell you that the, from the first time I met Felina, I was so impressed by his passion and his experience. Uh, plus he's so generous with sharing that experience and knowledge. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Felina and one of his colleagues. The session is entitled Decolonizing Science and Moving Towards Inclusive Science. I am very interested to learn more about this topic and I'm sure you are too. So today is a hybrid session. We are very grateful to have folks with us in person here in New York and online. Welcome to all of you. So near or far from whatever time zone you're joining us, I hope you will enjoy this presentation and discussion. I hope you will learn a little and be inspired too. Uh, please remember at the end to fill out the feedback form in the summit program. Felina, the floor is yours. Okay. Thank, Thank you, everyone, and thanks, thanks Heather, for the wonderful introduction and uh, putting everything together. Uh, and hi to everyone in the, in the room, and hi to everyone online uh, from wherever you're joining. So let me share my screen. Uh, all right. And uh, so... <clears throat> Before we start, I'll give you a very brief introduction on how this session is going to be and what we are covering and so on. Uh, this is actually a, a, the decolonized science is a is a topic uh, that not just myself but a bunch of us are working on, and not just from and from all the disciplines of of science because it's affecting uh, science academia, science education, and science outreach as well. And uh, so today uh, we will, I, I'll give a, a talk more like overview talk on uh, focusing on some of the issues we have and some of the areas we should look into and how can we sort of uh, move things forward. And then later on, uh, we will have uh, Tana Joseph from uh, University of Amsterdam and she's also the deputy officer for Dutch astronomy. And Tana will, and I will have a, a discussion on on bringing a bit more personal experience into some of the topics at, that I'll be covering in, in the in the lecture. And uh, so the session itself objectives I really want to uh, focus a bit more on why are we doing this and what actually the purpose of uh, a session like this and. Uh, one of the main goals and objectives in everyone who's working on decolonizing is actually awareness. And that's the number one, the key, because it's still uh, pretty much of a, a ongoing, mostly discussion rather than actions. So awareness is really, really key. And I have, I will get into that later. And you can see at some point, it's quite difficult to even convince someone this is actually happening. And, and then you need to move into dialogue, like have conversations as much as possible. And it could be 
uh, your colleagues, peers, or it could be uh, policymakers if you really want to make a difference. And then uh, try to work on collaborations, like for example, how Tan and I are collaborating on certain things. And uh, and then we need actions, like actions, but actions can be like grassroots le level, uh, which are like social movement done by scientists or uh, science communicators or at policy level. And uh, because changing certain things, especially imagine trying to change a, a curriculum. And so you need, really need uh, policymakers being involved in, in this uh, topic. So uh, these sort of like the four objectives we have in, from this session. And, and although we are in, I mean, this session is about two and a half hours, but uh, the, the efforts and the conversation will go beyond this. So I'm happy if, if anyone listening in, joining in, want to uh, join our efforts coming up in the future. And, and we'll, we'll have our contact details on our website and, and we'll find a way to uh, get in touch with us. Okay, so uh, before we, before I even begin uh, to sort of go into science part, it's kind of, let me, I'm sure uh, you have an idea of what is colonial, uh, colonialism is, but let me just touch base very briefly uh, to refresh everyone's mind. So colonialism is more, more of a, a political act where one party uh, seeds power over uh, another. And, uh, and, I, and I should have added in the beginning that I am originally from Sri Lanka and living in Japan. And uh, we, this kind of personal details we'll get into uh, during the discussion, but uh, I think context might do you a bit more. And interestingly, I happen to work uh, the three countries which colonized Sri Lanka, which is I worked with uh, in Netherlands and Portugal and uh, England, and uh, which is one fun way to look at my career as well. And uh, so, Historically, you know, the colonization has resulted in a large economic gains for the colonizer itself. And, and a lot of these uh, countries are still uh, very much of experience that wealth and the profit and so on that gained during the colonization uh, period. And uh, on the other hand, uh, for, for the colonized, was such a loss in terms of economic and even cultural, like historical, even religion, and uh, and this to recover from from some of these, it takes years and years. And even in Sri Lanka, I still experience uh, some of this aftermath. Uh, and so, what is so since we have an idea about colonization, what is sort of like decolonization? Uh, this is where when you have heard many countries celebrate like Independence Day, you know, getting freedom. And this is sort of like decolonizing when, when this one country or party, like a region withdrawing from the former colony and leaving it independent. However, it, it's if uh, like, for example, if we look into even Sri Lanka, how uh, the independence is given, it's, it's quite funny that that expectation of carrying over things as it's supposed to be is quite high, but it doesn't really happen in the same way. It's such a many countries collapsed as, as soon as the, with the independence, it took years to uh, even to get the, the political uh, society going. And, uh, and then uh, we nowadays, like last couple of decades, we, we talk, discuss a lot about post-colonialism. And, and interestingly, there's so many different versions and meanings and uh, definitions for what is post-colonialism. And uh, it, in my personal, like reading all these uh, scholarly papers and books, it, it almost seems a lot of the times the, the post-colonialism has diluted within like globalization because we love like pretty much the world move into being globalized with, uh, between last like 50 years. And, uh, and, but this is mostly to, you know, build economies and so on. And, but being 
from a colonized country, I can I would like to say that we are still in the post colonialism period. We are still really suffering from uh, and trying to figure out things. So I would say from the day whoever, like whichever the region or the country received uh, the, their freedom, and, and even now you're still experiencing post-colonialism. And uh, so it's not something that we are done with it and we are still going through it. Uh, so it's when you, when, when, when we actually think about what are the sort of like uh, good things. I mean, I hear this uh, argument a lot of the times of you, like, especially if you uh, look into some of the treaties that was uh, signed uh, with the getting freedom uh, and independence. Uh, there's a lot of discussions of uh, fortune and resources and, and uh, skills given to the country. Uh, I can get like really good example is uh, countries like Sri Lanka, India ended up with uh, railway tracks and, and like some of the businesses like, for example, tea. And tea became a huge uh, business in Sri Lanka. And so technically the argument uh, that we hear all the time and also written in publishing many of the Western publication is this uh, fortune given by the colonizer uh, so that you can actually prosper. And, but in fact, it's, it, it's not really the same way that this reversal of fortune works. And for example, India has actually negative GD, uh, GDP for, for a period of time when after they uh, didn't like sign from the colonization time and to recover after the, uh, they received freedom. And uh, most of the colonized world were rather poor uh, when they were colonized even the period uh, following that. And these fortunes or rather like things that left over didn't really work in the same way that the colonizers actually claimed to. And uh, one of the uh, really, uh, really nice example I would like to give is that Ceylon tea is world famous. Anywhere you go, any country you can find Ceylon tea. But if you look into the number of companies who are making Ceylon tea and the companies are, that are based in Sri Lanka is really small. And a lot of these companies are based uh, from different, uh, many other countries. And so large part of the profit goes in outside of the country and we don't really get that, that much of profit, even though tea is one of the biggest export um, in Sri Lanka. So uh, some of the things that uh, the effects of post-colonialism is that we see uh, in these colonized countries, especially is uh, elitism. So it, it's interesting how we look at uh, so-called elite, elite like a uh, society in think of Western white uh, like a region or, or society, but you can like in many of the countries who are colonized, there, there are people who work with the Western uh, cultures and they were given ranks. And this is how the class system actually started. And uh, for example, my great grandparents have English names and, and they were sort of like, I mean, that luckily died down and I have a, a Sri Lankan name, but uh, these, sort of give the, 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 the ranking given, the names given, and all these sort of started this class system. And, and you can still see how these were used locally to get certain things done, to have some power over certain groups and, and, and to be a decision maker. And uh, in fact, this, this goes, I mean, I didn't recognize this when I was a, a school student in, in Sri Lanka. I, I happen to be, uh, I would say for the top 
school in Sri Lanka, which is called Royal College. Mm -hmm. And uh, ironically, but it, some of these uh, colleges, like schools in, in Sri Lanka, which are top and, and built during the British times, so like going on for like 100 years. And it's just that name carries, like Harvard, name carries huge weight, but you, it becomes, you become an elite and you can actually use it to get things done. And even if you're really bad at education, it doesn't matter. So, and, and these, we don't really, I mean, I didn't recognize this as a, as a child uh, studying. And then hierarchy system is, is uh, also plays a huge, uh, huge power and huge issue, especially some certain uh, countries uh, in Asia, color has, uh, like we, we always see historically white color as a bit more uh, over the top and, and something a bit more larger than uh, us. But even within, the within these countries, there are different skin colors. I mean, I, my, I'm brown, but I don't really represent exactly the, the color of Sri Lanka because they, everyone is so many different shades. And, and my father is much more lighter. And, uh, and then you also, like the, the paler, the fairer you are, much good looking or much better and more uh, opportunities to get a job and which actually comes into the play. Uh, if, you walk, if you go around uh, some of these, uh, at least in South Asian countries, like whitening creams and so on, you know, and, and plenty of these. So these higher systems like skin color and age, and when, when, if I bring this back to academia, and age is a huge uh, part in, in academia, especially in our cultures, uh, because it's sort of, we, for more than like, more, like about hundreds and hundreds of years, age has come to play through this class system, hierarchical system. And there's a huge gap between uh, a student and a professor in many of the these Asian countries. And, and it, it's relevant to many other like region as well. And, uh, and then we go into globalization within, within like last 50 years. And uh, interestingly, this uh, education systems, uh, like globalization is mostly about like economic, uh, you know, economical changes, but uh, this ap applies to also education. So these countries had to develop their curriculums and, and try to, you know, start their school system. And, but we must also imagine, you know, how, would a country run their own country suddenly when the independence is given? And are we taking that same curriculum and carry on, carrying on, or are we supposed to change it? And uh, so a lot of the time, the, the curriculum ended up moving forward and curriculum kept changing according to how globalization changed. So we, I mean, I have more knowledge, as a child, I had more knowledge about like, Western science and Western things than what's going on in Asia and what's going on in the country because we had more content in our curriculum outside of the country. And uh, so the, these are like, I only pointed out three, but there's many other uh, post-colonialism uh, effects uh, that you can see in even in daily life. So, I slowly want to move into uh, how this is ap applicable in in, uh, uh, academia, uh, in science academia. Uh, so I there are quite a lot of things that we can discuss. Uh, probably Tana and I can discuss a bit more of these. Uh, what is colonization in science? And so just during this my my talk, I'll point out uh, these six points. And we will go into uh, some of these in detail. So we we have seen, I mean, lately uh, in recent years, there's been like some really exciting space missions and, and larger uh, like plans to build uh, research infrastructures. And uh, so 
interestingly, how these large funded research projects uh, are built. Uh, first of all, it, it's also it need, we need to keep in mind that a lot of these projects are written by scientists, not really social scientists or uh, policymakers or even you know grassroots level uh, people who are from different countries. And uh, there we we especially when we set up. Uh, like ground based, let's uh, let's say say astronomy, and you need ground based telescope, which take a lot of uh, you need real estate, and uh, the demand for local resources in terms of like land and policy changes, and low taxes, and and then the human capacity build it, it, these demands are really really high, and but we. The, the the argument is always, but we are doing it for the science. We are not doing it for anything else. Everyone is in the in the in the science together, achieving the scientific advancement. Uh, I love hearing this. Oh my god! And uh, I think we tend to forget that scientific advancement should be done, which is really good, but it should be done in a way that it's actually benefit for all parties, not just one party. And then, uh, then we see a lot of the time global agendas. There's always frameworks and models, and and if you if you sort of some of these frameworks and global agendas, if you group, sort of trace them back, uh, many of the larger, really uh, famous. Uh, Agendas, especially in science or even in climate change, uh, uh, they are originated in Western countries, and, and it's quite difficult for uh, global South or developing countries to sort of match up to these frameworks because they are built thinking about Western resources and and more money and more resources and. Uh, like achieving that, achieving those uh, objectives through frameworks. And it's very difficult to fit these frameworks. SATs is a really good example. Uh, to get into a US university, you need to do SATs, right? Any, anyone in, anywhere in the world. And, but the education systems are so different and it's quite, it's, uh, it's quite and also really expensive to do some of these tests. And so we, when we, it doesn't mean that we shouldn't have frameworks or models. We do need them, but we need to have, build them in a way that are open enough to change and adapt. And one of the good examples is actually UN SDGs. There, there's no real, if you look into SDGs, they're very open and very broad. There's no specific, op like very, you need to do like one, two, three in order to achieve goal four. So it's very much of uh, open and broad. And if you check how uh, education, uh, the SDG on education achieved in US and, and then in, in Sri Lanka, it's, it's completely different. And, and you, there's no two countries doing the same in to achieve the same SDG. So, that's a really good example of how we can actually do things that are more inclusive. And, uh, and then uh, colonization in science, uh, in science curricula is, is, is really, it's at, it's at a very sad state uh, because we are so much of studying Western science right now. And it's been like that from the day one. And, uh, and we the the other thing is to support the science curriculum. We also build a lot of resources. We we get project funded. We get uh, like things funded and create like online activities, offline activities, even like hands on things. But they are all created towards this Western uh, science. And uh, there are a few countries who are making a difference in their science curriculum, like for example, New Zealand and Australia, who are trying, who are 
quite successful in adding Aboriginal science into the curriculum. And, and I, in fact, I heard yesterday there was a really wonderful uh, session at the UN where uh, this caller from New Zealand mentioned that New Zealand will be uh, able to uh, change their science uh, curriculum by 2025. Uh, so which is really good to hear uh, changing curriculum is really difficult. And to add in the local element like regional science uh, discoveries is quite important as well. And uh, then the other, another uh, aspect of colonization in science is data. You know, data, uh, especially think of um, science, uh, areas of science where you have to collect samples like marine biology or planetology. Or, um, and geology, where you somebody need to go to a place to collect samples or do some studies. And there's been so many issues in this area for the longest period, and, and including like from day from years of colonization up to now when it's going to continue for a longer period, where countries with this more, more power can go to another country and collect data and do whatever they want. And sometimes we have seen uh, seen these uh, instances where you have local policies set up, but there's the visiting party doesn't really follow those local policies. And and the simple, very simple answer for this, uh, or not answer like argument for this, always been oh it's very difficult to find local policies or local policies are in the local language. So we don't really understand. And, and we are following, we are scientists, we are following, we know what we are doing. So it, it's always funny to see a scientist like sci in science academia, you say, we know what we are doing. And, uh, but it's different. You are in another country and somebody else's uh, uh, land and we need to respect. And, and this goes from like both policy and ethics and because these are a lot of politi policy issues and work, but also very much of ethical issues, right? Uh, so there, there, there are instances. Uh, so one of the good things happened during the pandemic is that people were not able to travel. So how do you actually get data? And this goes to many other fields. And one of the quite famous journal in uh, U.S. in this region, uh, have, they have uh, photographers all over the world, right? So, and it wasn't really, uh, and these photojournalists couldn't travel during the uh, pandemic. So how do you get photos? You have to hire local photographers. And so suddenly so many photographers from mm -hmm. African nations actually came together and they were, they were busy, they were getting work. You know, they were getting published in some of these big American newspapers and magazines. And then on the other hand, in science, uh, these ongoing uh, expeditions, ongoing uh, data collections and sample collections would not continue. So you, have, you were forced to collaborate locally and, and work with locals. And this happened in like, countries like uh, even in Sri Lanka and even in Mexico, and Argentina and Kenya, Zimbabwe, so many countries like local scientists had to play a bigger role and collaborating. And uh, one of my uh, colleagues is actually working on following up how, uh, on scientific papers published uh, from these data collaborations because that's also interesting how much of local scientists are actually in the published papers because that has been a huge problem as well. And uh, Okay, so, and then moving uh, forward uh, about jobs. So we, of course, when somebody wants to move to another country, you would, would like to have a better salary. And, but there's been so many instances where for the same job, that you would hire a local person with a, like very much of a local salary, but for the same job, some a foreigner would be hired for uh, a completely absurd, like a level of uh, 
salary compared to a local salary. And uh, this this always has been a uh, the argument is because it's it's difficult to bring a foreign expert in unless you give a bigger salary. So it's not really about the foreign expert. It's about trying to give the same. It's a it's for the same job and and trying to give that same level of respect and same level of benefits for the local expert as well, because they, they are also experts in the same field and they do the same or maybe more sometimes level of uh, effort. And, uh, and the last one is one of my favorites where you, we, I come across a lot of time the researchers from more powerful countries uh, tend to know sometimes about mm -hmm. other nations more. Uh, the, the the knowledge in other nations, their uh, their sciences and their uh, culture and societies and so on, and uh, especially when I mean I have seen this in so many conferences, uh, especially uh, Asia and some sometimes in uh, uh, African nations, where some of the Western uh, Researchers, I have seen even somebody tried to correct me once about Sri Lanka and how we were handling uh, our telescopes, and uh, so it's a uh, it's a quite a privileged place to be, where I, that someone would think that you you are from powerful nation that you have much more knowledge uh, about what's going on in another nation when there are other experts in that nation who's been studying the same uh, bit more uh, hands-on and, and closer. Um, right, so uh, moving forward, I kind of want to look into some of these uh, examples and, and how uh, research and education and outreach uh, place, place into uh, our role uh, on decolonizing science. So one of the uh, focusing on sort of like either astronomy or some of the sciences that needs to be built uh, infrastructure, um, setting, like setting up labs and setting up certain things that you need specific areas and the Astronomy is a, one of the one of the good examples on this kind of uh, uh, setting up infrastructure because for astronomy you need either like really dark skies, really clear and dark skies, or uh, radio free zones. And these kind of regions are quite rare to find in powerful countries with a lot of money and funding and so on. So it ends up uh, setting up this uh, infrastructure in places like in Africa or Hawaii, Chile, Argentina, and so on, where you have access to land. And, uh, but there's been issues setting up these. So historically, the, the policies and how these were set up a bit looser. But now, as I mentioned in the beginning, one of the most important things of, on this field is the awareness. And more and more people are being aware and more and, and when I say awareness, it's not just within the scientists, it has to be within like public and, and uh, uh, policymakers and so on. And uh, so for example, in 20, 15 in Hawaii, when the during the IA uh, International Astronomical Union General Assembly was going on, there were a bunch of people protesting for uh, for the building of 30 meter telescope. And uh, so, one of the good things happened from this is to come up to this cultural impact assessment, where which is an assessment that you can anybody can use. What is the cultural impact on building a, an infrastructure? Because uh, in, in up until recently, most of the infrastructure infrastructures are looked into in a way where you look at jobs, and you look at you know the amount of 
money going into the country. So it's more about financial uh, and employment benefits, but not so much about cultural and even land uh, because uh, some telescope ended up in uh, ended up in uh, indigenous lands without knowing. And so these are huge ethical issues. And so establishing like ethical guidelines and, and also and accountability structure is important because the larger the project, it's very difficult to find who's actually accountable. And uh, so sort of looking and adding this cultural impact assessment uh, process and also uh, establishing like ethical guidelines and accountability is really important. Any sort of level of structure that you are going to build in somebody else's, some other nation. And uh, then, but what? A lot of the times that the we we always circle back this uh, scientific uh, infrastructure about as an investment for the country, like you are bringing in a lot of money, you are bringing in a lot of dollars, and and then this helps in long term to build human capital development by getting jobs and and so on, like jobs as in like engineering jobs and you know building jobs and so on, not particularly scientific jobs. And uh, so this is all also sort of how white savior syndrome works, where uh, historically, uh, you know, that even during colonization period, that where you go to another nation, say, oh, let me help you. You all are struggling, and we have better ideas to run this country or your resources. And uh, so in the same way in science, we are repeating the same mistakes in, in this white savior syndrome, um, investment, uh, investing on things and looking at like more looking at data rather than the human needs and the societal needs and so on. Uh, and yeah, and, and just an example of that some years ago, this is actually uh, a talk that Tana gave where, uh, about the salary uh, different, uh, discrepancy from European based and then a local staff in Chile. And, but luckily some of these are changing, like people identify and sometimes it's, uh, well change do take time, but some it's nice to see some uh, times it's been uh, quite, Quick for changing. Uh, right. So I also want to touch base on outreach because I'm outreach is something I'm heavily involved, in and uh, that also my expertise is in. And uh, so one of the things I mentioned in the beginning is about this setting up of global agendas and frameworks, and this is. This is quite commonly seen in outreach where we have like global programs. And, and quite a lot of times, uh, if we trace back in many of the different sciences, uh, you have um, these programs originating from Western countries and Western ideologies. And, uh, and sometimes these, you're celebrating a specific day, but for a large majority of the world, it's a holiday and it's a, like a religious one. And, uh, and there's global efforts need doing without local relevance is a, is a bit of issue. And, but also one of my pet peeves, is, pet peeves is actually this quota filling where a lot of the time these global programs say, oh, we reached 100 countries, wherein there's like one event or from India, which have like millions of people and millions of science, like hundreds of science groups. And so it's a quota filling just for the sake of a report is also quite unfold for, and there are ways you can do much more in, in terms of like, rather than saying number of countries, you can say actually number of events in these countries not that you reach, nobody is, no one can reach 100 countries. And even the one in, in my lifetime, the 
the most active science activities happened in Sri Lanka was 2009, where we had, uh, we had which was a UN declared year of uh, astronomy. And we had about two, 300 events per year um, in, within that year. But overall, from that 20 million people, I think we reached about 50,000 people. And it's, we never reached a, a nation, country, that, that's not the reality. So this quota filling is, is, a, is another way that we are uh, sort of saying uh, outreach programs. And which is interesting uh, also in, in colonial times, sometimes uh, if you look at some of the maps from the back then, they say, they say that the Dutch dominated region or the Portuguese dominated region. And in fact, some of the regions in, in Asia were not really because some of these countries became countries later on and, and breaking up. And, but some regions had their own independence. They, they fought for it. And some, some regions were able to really fight off the Dutch or the Portuguese uh, at some point and, and held their part. But it doesn't reflect on the historically in, in the maps and, and some of the reports. And, uh, and then uh, in outreach, we, we try to do a lot of uh, project proposals like collaborations in outreach and try to get funding. And uh, uh, it's, it's also important. And there are a number of funding uh, opportunities where globally available from different foundations and organizations that people can apply to do uh, outreach projects with a with a global like it can be like from from US to Africa, and so it's really important to add a critical review on these projects to make sure that it doesn't fall into these parachute science efforts where either somebody from a global north or western country uh, get a grant or, or large funding to go and go to like. Sri Lanka, Zimbabwe, one of these countries to do one of it, one of events. And they spend most of the money for the team traveling to this country, but not really locally for, to build local resources and so on. And this has happened so much in some of the field, like in my field in astronomy outreach in the uh, last few decades. And, and slowly I'm, I'm seeing change, which is really nice. And, but parachute science was, was so, much prominent, and and I have contributed to that as a, and I can see uh, why this uh, can be a problem to overcome because when I was a student in Sri Lanka, so we we didn't have astronomy uh, at research level uh, back then, but we still don't have, and so which means we don't have any local expert, so. But it's also a very, I mean, tourism is one of the biggest uh, income for the country. So it's a very attractive country for people to visit. And so we, I would randomly get connected to somebody from US or uh, in Europe that uh, has the potential to want to visit, who want to come to Sri Lanka to, to give a talk. And as a student, like a, 15 year old a student in Sri Lanka, I would jump into this opportunity to get someone to you know, come and speak to all the students and inspire us, give us knowledge and so on. Because you can't, I mean, now, now you have internet, this is before internet and we only had textbooks. And uh, we, we didn't have, there's no such for, there was a thing called astronomy books. Uh, like we, I remember one of the first books I received uh, from some uh, professor uh, in the US, about 20 of us has, has read that one single book. And so when, when you get sort of like an opportunity, an expert visiting you, then you jump into that opportunity because we, you don't have the expertise and the resources. And, and the person would come, and for us, the important thing is this, this person doing a lecture. But, and we don't look into what's what's the core program, what's the you know why this is, this person is coming, what's it, what is this program? None of us actually, none of that is 
really important since our main uh, focus would be lack of resources, lack of expertise. So we get an opportunity to hold on to that. And, but turns out a lot of people who came uh, got really big grants to travel and, and set up programs and, and do things, which none of that happened, but we did gain the knowledge that, that one hour lecture that we received. And so there's a lot of parachute science efforts going on and in all different sciences. And this is for outreach and also for research because there's research grants, uh, there's a lot of research grants uh, being given to travel to uh, other countries to like do conduct work, research workshop and research, research training and so on. And, but in terms of thinking, how do we uh, sort of, exp how do we think long-term? One, one really good example is that uh, Japan, where I currently work, uh, had a program uh, some years ago where Japanese government donated uh, big telescopes. I mean, like rather big for, for a country without a telescope. It's a 45 uh, centimeter telescope. So 45, uh, uh, 45 inches telescope. And these telescopes were called white elephants and they were given to a bunch of countries. And uh, the one in Sri Lanka is uh, is set up right next to a main road, and every time a vehicle goes past, the whole telescope shakes. You there's no research value in this big and um, big observatory because you can't really do research when the telescope is shaking, and so it's one of the things where one of the example where you have enough money to donate a this really expensive product, but it's don't really check if there's a local expertise to really set it up in a proper way and think long-term or provide the expertise to set up. And, and for a country like Sri Lanka, we are not able to relocate a, such a big instrument. So it's just an additional cost that we can't afford. And so there's, there's, there are incidents like this all over the world where certain things are donated, certain things are given, but has really, really low value locally because it's not set up properly. And yeah, so, and then moving on to a uh, little bit of uh, curriculum, as I mentioned that uh, the current, current core curriculum is basically uh, started in, in, in Europe and, and that curriculum still continues today and it hasn't changed in most of the world. And uh, so it, it was nice to hear that uh, Australia and, and New Zealand especially moving in the direction to change the curriculum. And uh, what, what, I mean, I understand that Eurocentric curricula is not the, I mean, it's not the hard part, but thinking that vast majority of the students in the world at school experiencing a, for a science as war in culture. And, and, but then teachers, most of the teachers actually don't have the time and the capacity to sort of bring in the local or the regional sciences into the curriculum. I mean, anywhere I go, teachers are always quite stressed because their workload is really, really heavy. And, and uh, sometimes I think teachers are actually working more than even scientists. They're always really he heavy workload and there's no uh, time to really bring in this other like local or the regional knowledge in, into the classroom. And so it's difficult to even think of this science as a foreign culture because that the some science is what we are known as is Western. And a lot of the science from like Arabic world or the Indian is an indigenous like world, uh, indigenous cultures are missing. And so it, we need to sort of find a balance somehow. And uh, 
Yes, yeah, so this is also something I noticed uh, uh, from Tana's talk uh, that we did uh, maybe last year or year before. And uh, so I, uh, I have been in, I've been working in, in, with Europe for last more than a decade. And uh, it, it's some of these European projects are about like exploring the world, you know, conquering the world, which is still basic, basically how uh, colonizers, so like what they want to do with the rest of the world. And, and it, it's interesting to see some of these narratives are still playing in, in science that once they're once Europeans were once explorers and, and always explorers and still exploring. And which is yes, exploring is good, but those who are colonized are, are saying in a way that are you, you know, these explorers and discoveries and new worlds, are we and, and my only hope is that we are not repeating the history, but a lot of the times the how we see uh, things are being repeated. Um, right, so with all, all the discussions and, and findings and, and uh, areas that we look into, uh, we tend to think this is how the system is sort of, you know, going on right now, it's, it's this process. And and uh, it's it's just broken. We we always say it's broken, and but it's not really broken. We, I mean, somebody made it. Like we, all of us, like people who are alive today and people who are not with us today, we all built it, and so we should be able to change it. And and it's 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 basically our job to change it because we built it. As humans, and we can change it. And uh, right, so how in, in decolonizing science, like starting from awareness, uh, we need to sort of confront this imperialism, the colonialism, and the, and the racism in, going on in, in modern science. And sometimes these are really, really difficult conversations. I mean, I the comments I have received is uh, blows my mind, but you still need to have these kind of visions. And, and from also I am learning. I mean, I mentioned that even as a colonizer, I have support, I have been part of even uh, supporting this colonizing science, like supporting parachute efforts and so on, because uh, my awareness was not there. So even for me, this is all of this is a learning experience and 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 moving forward. Uh, and then we need to sort of change the approach of these hierarchies that exist in in academia, and which still in certain countries are quite higher. Like I I see that in Japan a lot, and uh, and then. Uh, we can take certain actions by putting in policies and so on for like things like parachute science, and uh, and eventually, hopefully, like countries like uh, following countries like New Zealand and North Korea as an example, we will be able to uh, this move away from glorified Western science into adding like a broad range of sciences that matters uh, for local perspectives and then global understanding and so on. Uh, right. And with that, uh, I'm gonna see if we have Tana is also online. Yeah? Okay. And uh, yeah, also, if anyone has questions, we are happy to uh, bring those into uh, the discussion. Can I, let me see if I can get on. Uh,
stop sharing the screen. Yeah, I'm gonna show one more slide and then I will stop sharing my uh, slides. Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, so Tana and I will discuss a couple of things, uh, but I will also want to get into uh, a discussion with Tana with this, some of the immediate reactions that uh, probably Tan also while, while talking to her, her, her uh, perspectives and that what we, what I have received. So all, all, even with all of these discussions and I have given talks on decolonizing for a uh, number of times. And uh, there's always the context of, you know, reaction from scientists where uh, saying, I'm not, I'm, that I'm only helping, and helping should not be considered as you know colonizing science. And uh, but we are providing a lot of resources, or we, it's not really relevant to me. It's not my job. Uh, or asking, are you sub suggesting to stop what we are doing? And and or you should be grateful for what we are actually doing. So these are like the major reactions I have received, and also I'm sure Tana shares that with me. And which is interesting, and uh, we will get into some of this during the discussion. So let me stop uh, sharing. And see. Hi, Tana. Hello, hello, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be here with you all today. Can you do the new yeah. 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 <laughs> we are both spotlight, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, have you pinned yourself? No. Do you mind clicking bullets doing a remove pin up on your corner there? Yeah. Oh, there we are. perfect. Okay. Great. Hi, Tana. You're in a big you're in a couple of screens. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we uh, we will go through several different things, but I think uh, first let us also start with uh, inter introducing ourselves uh, again for this session. Tana, would you like to go first? Take your time and... Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, once again, thank you for uh, inviting me to be a part of this um, interesting and necessary discussion on uh, decolonization in the, in the context of science. My name is Dr. Tana Joseph, and I am a South African astronomer currently based in the Netherlands. And here in the Netherlands, I have a dual role um, if you've looked at my profile or seen the, the little bio of mine, you'll see that um, my affiliation is with the University of Amsterdam. And um, in that capacity, I work part-time as a postdoctoral research fellow or postdoctoral researcher. Uh, and I study black holes and neutron stars in double star systems outside of our galaxy. And then the other part of my time, I am the equity and inclusion officer for Dutch astronomy. And in that capacity, I work with the Netherlands Astronomy Inclusion and um, Equity Committee that is part of the astronomy, the Dutch Astronomy Council. And so I get to split my time between doing science and, be doing, um, and doing sort of the social justice part of science as well. And I'm really enjoying this work. It keeps me very busy. 
uh, but it's also this is the first time that I've ever been in a paid position to do this job and that's a whole other talk and a whole other panel discussion um, that needs to be had um, apart from decolonization the kind of the way that we do equity diversity and inclusion work um, in general in the sciences in corporate etc and so I have a, a particular interest in um, this decolonization work and we'll get to that as well how I got into it and how I am like most scientists self-taught in this area and what that actually means for uh, for our work going forward. Great, thank you. Um, great. Um, thanks, Sana. And uh, yeah, great that they actually got, uh, managed to have set up this position, paid position, which is really, really important. And, uh, and those who are joining now uh, for our second session, uh, welcome. So right now we, are, uh, we have Sana uh, Joseph. And then myself, um, I'll do a brief introduction as well. Uh, my name is Tilina Hina Tegala. I'm uh, from Sri Lanka and currently working in Japan at the Earth Life Science Institute. And, uh, and previously, I, I worked uh, in, uh, in mostly in, uh, with European uh, institutions from in the uh, Netherlands and also Portugal and in, uh, England. And my current work is mostly uh, on science communication and outreach at uh, my institution and, and also science communication teaching. And then outside of that, uh, outside of my institution work, I also work on uh, astrometry projects and which is actually really uh, close to me because uh, we, a lot of the developing countries don't have uh, research level astronomy so I have set up a program uh, that we, since I'm based at a, one of the uh, G7 countries now have access to apply, I have able to apply to a uh, telescope time. And so through this program, uh, I give, I set up uh, student research groups in uh, different countries like Sri Lanka, uh, uh, Bangladesh, or, and where, we uh, study double stars or exoplanets on uh, the astronomy measurement. And uh, so how did, let me start uh, with how did I come to work on the decolonizing science topic and why that's actually personally relevant to me. And uh, Tan will also share her thoughts later on uh, how things got into uh, today. So, this, it, it's not a, uh, even though I'm coming from a colonized country, it hasn't been an obvious theme or topic for many years that I was in, I was aware of. I was always uh, experienced uh, differences working in, in uh, academia as a person of color and person of minority, and also a uh, person coming, living uh, in Western countries. Uh, but it took me a while to really put these experiences together to see that these are actually effects, some of these effects of decolon like colonial science. And so we, especially for uh, countries like Sri Lanka, where we, are uh, at a really struggle, staggering way losing our experts because pretty much a lot of the local experts are moving out of the country and, and because we don't have the local infrastructure to keep them. But at the same time, we are, all, a lot of the local things uh, that are done in a way from funding from other countries are not really thought long-term. And we, we, it's mostly very much a parachute effort like to celebrate something or to do a workshop or one-off efforts. And so, and I have been a contributor to that for a longer time when I was a school, like student in Sri Lanka. And, and this happens because of lack of uh, resources. And so I, 
it's one of the things I really want to change and why it's personally important to me. And, and since I'm at a uh, certain committees and level that I'm close to policy changes right now, so it's quite relevant and, and it's a good time for me to also work on these topics that I can influence certain things. Uh, so that's sort of my interest in changing academia and making it more inclusive and also making it better for especially, especially making it better for people coming from developing countries. And Tana, how about you? My sort of consciousness raising moment um, around decolonization came when I was a postdoctoral fellow at the University of Cape Town um, from 2013 to 2016. And during that time, we had the uh, these uh, roads must fall decolonization protests at the universities uh, across South Africa that became quite famous worldwide. And I participated in those protests and I uh, supported them in various ways as well. Um, what I found that of course these protests were started by students in the humanities. It was no engagement really from scientists, but I was also raised in a very politically conscious and active household. And so in these protests sprung up, I was one of the few scientists that actually went and got involved. And during the discussions that happened, um, these fora that happened where the students were talking and everything, I, I turned up because I wanted to know more. And they had one about decolonizing science. And at first, when people started saying decolonizing science, it was met with derision, laughter. People were like, oh, you're delegitimizing the, the uh, protests and the movement by saying decolonize science, because even by um, it was still science was still seen as this search for objective truth, even by people who are extremely knowledgeable about decolonization. They were like, no, you leave science alone because science is about collecting facts and how can that possibly be colonized? And so I wanted to hear more about this. And in these discussions, I was challenged. I was asked, um, you know, these were students in undergrad and they were looking at me as a postdoctoral fellow you know, someone who had spent 10 years at the university and said, why did you never speak up? Why did you, you know, why are you latching onto our thing? Thank you for supporting, but why didn't you do this while you were a student? And I just said to them, I was entirely ignorant of this. And actually we can decolonize science and this is something that we must take seriously. It's not, um, it's not, you know, it's not about counting photons differently or, you know, bacteria is going to change um, if you decolonize science. It's not about that kind of thing, but what is science is the first question we need to ask ourselves. And it's not just about collecting facts and writing them down in a book and teaching that to children at school. Um, there's so much more. And once you have a better understanding of what science is and isn't, you can see where naturally the framework of decolonization fits in there. So just to kind of very quickly go over what science is, um, people who have thought about this a lot more and are much more knowledgeable about this, um, such as Jonathan Marks has said that basically science is three things. It's a, it's a series of techniques. So that's what most people stop at. They're like, you do the scientific method, you count the thing or you measure the thing and you write it down and that's science, but it's also a community of people. So automatically where you have people, you have biases, you have um, all sorts of things like that, that a lot of people don't want to talk about because they think scientists are robots that don't bring any biases to their work wrong. Thirdly, science is also a information structure in conversation with power, as Marx put it. And so to me, I've added a fourth dimension to this, that science is political. If science wasn't political, then why would we have this? Why would we be having this chat at the UNGA? It would have nothing to do with politics and positionality. When you have people and when you have uh, power hierarchies and when you have money, you have politics. And when you think about science in that more holistic sense, then decolonization framework makes more sense than just, you know, than this idea that science is about collecting objective facts. And so, to me personally, I had to be called out and held accountable and I'm still 
I can picture so clearly this young woman who challenged me and I never got her name, but I think about her a lot when I'm asked to give talks like this because I am very grateful for her for trying to hold me accountable like that. Um, and, you know, getting in my face and saying, why didn't you do more? And I hope that we, if she ever hears a talk that I give, um, I hope that I'm loving up to her expectations. Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's very interesting. Also, uh, you know, some of the things you mentioned, uh, fine, let me um, bring it a bit more uh, at a global stage where that, you know, how you, how you got into uh, this topic in back in South Africa, and then now you are in the Netherlands. And sort of similarly, we both have left where we come from and working uh, elsewhere. And, and which also, I'm, I'm sure you have uh, seen uh, this, when it comes to employment, the discrepancies between how it is to be like at an international job or in a local job. And, and I remember um, at a symposium in probably last year, you mentioned uh, this topic where our local and international, like local and foreigners are getting paid differently. What, what can you, uh, what, what's your experience and sort of how, do we, how can we even change this? So that's a very interesting topic because of course, um, if you want to really talk about decolonization and accessibility and equity, all these buzzwords, um, some of which you so beautifully elucidated in your talk uh, just before this, we need to talk about, you know, we live in a capitalist society and so money talks, money is power, money is access. And when you pay people differently, you say to them, we value some people more than others. And there are numerous examples in astronomy where this is the case. So the European Southern Observatories, which you also talked about, they have a local pay scale and an international pay scale. And these were all things that were agreed with previous governments. So this happens in, for instance, in Chile, where we have some of the best um, astronomy in instrumentation in the world. And these were all agreements that were made by the European Southern Observatories or ESO with uh, the, the Chilean governments at the time, decades ago, and there's a lot of bureaucracy involved. And so that's often used as, that's used as the main excuse for why you don't want, why it's hard to change things. That and the fact that, um, you know, they say, well, we need to pay international people more, otherwise they won't want to come and work here. So these are the kind of reasons given they're quite flimsy, of course, if you think mm -hmm. about them. Um, and in South Africa, we have this way, for instance, at the postdoctoral level, Everyone is paid the same if you're funded by the Square Kilometer Day um, Consortium in South Africa, but we have these massive grants for professors to come in. And it's a lot, a lot, a lot of money, especially when you consider that South Africa is um, by the, if you use the Gini coefficient, the most unequal society when it comes to income distribution. And so we, it's also this kind of thing of parachuting people in, we bring these top-notch scientists in from abroad, because, you know, if we don't give them this money, they won't come. And um, at the expense of local talent. And as far as I know, there's also no, there's never this discussion of a roadmap of how we're going to at some point stop this amazing, um, this amazing kind of exchange program for senior professors and start putting local people, Africans in place. That's, um, I don't know when that's going to happen. There's, I, I've never heard anyone talk about a time scale for this. The idea is just that we don't have the required talent and we need to bring these people in on exorbitant salaries to try and help us. But no handover talk is ever happening. So does this continue indefinitely where people come in, usually in the European winter or the global or the Northern Hemisphere winter and our summer, and they come and they um, spend a lot of time in the sunshine and everything. So they get lots of money and a work paid holiday. Um, and, you know, at some point they also lecture or 
talk to their students or whatever the case yeah. may be. And so it looks like an amazing, amazing opportunity uh, for established professors in the, um, in the Northern Hemisphere to come down and have some sunshine. And when do we start to reap the benefits as, um, as South Africans? So, um, and then there's other issues with place structures where I won't get into um, that I'm fighting uh, on the other side, but this, it's very interesting as well, of course, that you bring up that both of us are from uh, colonized countries and now we are working, you know, we, we, we're part of that brain drain that we always talk about. And I like to call it my, uh, my reverse colonization tour because prior to being in the Netherlands, which was one of the countries that colonized South Africa, I was uh, in the UK, uh, which is the other country that uh, colonized South Africa. And, um, and so what part of the reason I'm here is because nowhere else in the world, as far as I could see, when I was applying, was there this opportunity to do paid equity, diversity and inclusion work, which is not the same as decolonization work, uh, to do paid work like that, uh, where they actually recognize my job as a real thing that I can put on my CV and I get money for it. So I also have to go with the money is because as much as I feel that this work is important, I cannot set myself on fire to keep other people warm. I can't work for free because I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm not an heiress. I haven't won the lottery. So I can also only go where I can support myself. Yeah, I can definitely relate to many of the things you said. And, and I was thinking of all these, uh, uh, some of the researchers who went to, uh, that I personally know of to Sri Lanka during winter because of the, and Sri Lanka happened to be the best time to go to Sri Lanka is during December to April. And it's the best time to avoid also winter. And uh, in fact, I know a group going there for some field work this December. Uh, anyway, and our, our economy is quite down uh, right now. So the, the dollars go a long, mm -hmm. long way uh, mm -hmm. as well. And so a lot of these folks are, you know, it's about these collaborations and funding. And so, some of the things I'm, I've been thinking and trying to put into practice and especially uh, in, in grant proposals that I'm involved on reviewing and that how do we sort of put decolonizing science practices into collaborations and into funding and how, how can also, we actually, sorry, there's yeah. also a question about this in the in the chat. I don't know if you can see the chat. Someone has yeah. kind of asked this question as well about yeah. about research grants and how it's um, um, maintaining and sustaining the the colonized uh, col the sort of colonized way of doing science. Yeah. We just add okay. in so we can address that question as well. Yeah, I just summarized it. Okay, great. Sorry, I can't see the chat. Oh, okay. Now. You want to read it? Okay. Yeah, so how, how can we influence policy change at our own institute? Do you think it's uh, fair to respect grants allowing such field work or research unless it offers something more meaningful to the indigenous scientists and the scientific output of those countries? Yeah, that's a really good question. And exactly what we were uh, plan planning to sort of discuss. Uh, yeah, do you wanna go ahead and uh, and input something um, I this think, question as well? I think these kind of when it comes to funding and that you need to kind of go from the top down. And so it needs to be brought to the funding bodies themselves. They need to restructure how they hand out this money and include, you know, include so the I always liken uh, my first love, which is science communication to this EDI work and decolonization work, the social justice work that I'm doing now. And um, science communication, SciComm is a little bit further ahead in terms of being legitimized and understood and supported. Um, and a lot, of, um, a lot of, say for instance, the SK in South Africa, the SKA, um, how they, award time on telescopes or um or how you have to write your telescope proposal there's often a part where you have to say what your science communication 
um, strategy is going to be and how you're actually going to communicate your work because as we all know the science is not done until it's been communicated and so we need to start taking that same approach you won't get funding unless you can show us you know what does your EDI framework look like your equity diversity and inclusion framework what does your decolonization framework look like um, what does your science communication framework look like and that should be judged equally with the scientific method because indeed um, we shouldn't separate those things they are the same things um, the typical thing to say is oh you know we want diversity but not at the expense of uh, you know, of, of scientific quality, which is kind of a racist thing to say. Um, if you think about, not kind of, it is, it's a racist thing to say. Uh, so we need to start funding bodies and um, senior management, those at the levers of power. And unfortunately also those who stand to lose the most um, when we just try to dismantle the status quo, uh, need to start building this into their you know their mandates and how they start handing out the funding and if you are found to be in contravention of that you lose your funding that kind of thing is already starting to happen at some funding bodies for instance the nih in the us um they conduct audits to see you know if people are behaving responsibly and so on and they have pulled money from um from pis um, when they were found to be in contravention of codes of conduct for instance yeah and well, also there are actually, uh, for example, uh, there was a paper uh, about in, I think it's from Mexico, about a sample collection. Uh, and I'm talking about 20 years old, a paper, which I can't recall exactly, but that was a really good example where that a policy change was taken into account after these fossils were collected from a country without the awareness of the country itself. And, and these were taken back to US. And, uh, and I, so I'm sorry, I can't really uh, recall that uh, exact, exact paper, but this, Took, it took about 10 years, but later there were policies in place after realizing that, you know, the, this, some res local resources was taken out without the knowledge of uh, locals. And I think, so the uh, influence in policy changes uh, can take time. And, and sometimes I, I have seen it's almost a lot of the times especially at in, like a larger level, institutions or government level, it's almost as, as if it, when something happened, the reaction is the policy change rather than before happening something and you set up policies already. And I think it, it, it's all quite common to many other fields where you, know, you react with the policy rather than setting up the policies first and, and thinking about you know, different scenarios. And uh, and about the and also uh, uh, in terms of in, specifically for institutions to uh, change policies is that it you have to think a bit long term like the effect on on policies. Uh, one of the reasons actually. Uh, you might not benefit today or, or in your career. And, and that's something you, we have to think about when it comes to policies. But probably somebody down the line will benefit from that policy. And, and that's something I always say about anybody, or like most of us working in Japan, that right now we are going through all of us almost like guinea pigs to change policies. And we are struggling, and there's so many things that Japan is, uh, you know, when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, having foreign researchers. But hopefully, the things we are trying to do and things we are trying to change will benefit somebody down the line 10, 20 years later. And I think it's good to think maybe it's for the social good, for the future, for someone else. And, uh, and then 
about, I oh, could you want to also address this uh, uh, about the restriction in grants and in such field work and research and so on. And I, there are many of the grants already have so many different restrictions. Right? Grants always comes with many different restrictions and like who can apply and where from where you can apply. So having sort of adding different sort of restrictions that would benefit another nation is would not really uh, sort of take, I, I wouldn't say we are going back in science, but it's rather going forward in science, but allowing others to stepping in and, and being, and, and this also forces people to collaborate. And you, when you have restrictions on certain things, uh, it forces you to find somebody local, forces you to find some local experts. And, and but there are many instances there are no local experts. And, and there are like, for example, if somebody wants to set up a astronomy research facility in Sri Lanka, we don't have local experts. How do we do that? But we do have experts who are close enough, who are sort of have have the similar ideas, but don't have the resources to do it. And so in that way, it's, it's good to think about not just the, the scientific output, but also the social output of um, the, these outcomes of the grants. Uh, yeah. That, okay, so moving on, uh, there, there are one or two other questions, but let, let's, also get get to them in uh, uh, in after one or two topics that we wanted to cover, and so these uh, colonial practices has you know affected the development of scientific research, and that like just like the uh, question the first the earlier question that we we uh, we were addressing that. Can would the science actually be affected by trying to do uh, trying to take step thinking about you know decolonizing science? Are we setting back things? Are we putting so much restriction? But at the same time, we could also look at these how colonial practices potentially affecting the development of uh, scientific research and. One of the things I uh, mentioned is that you know when we when Sri Lanka received the first big telescope mm -hmm. that uh, that has the potential to do scientific research, uh, it was given without any expertise or guidance, and more of a donation, and so that's that could have been an easy sort of a fix if, if both parties had this long-term sort of a idea to like, how do we give this, but maybe provide expertise for next certain years and also look into, uh, there are different experts who can recognize the sites where a telescope should go. Mm -hmm. and, and that's a completely different level of expertise and which we don't, we didn't, never had in Sri Lanka. So these kind of, I, I would say always the in infrastructure going into another nation from uh, like from a nation, one nation to the other nation, it, it should go along with the expertise where either with or without the local expertise, then you not only give a donation, but also donation comes with some expertise that they can train locals and train uh, yeah. local educators, local scientists, and, and take, give them the opportunity to you know, use it uh, properly, develop science and produce science. And, but unfortunately, a lot of the times, uh, the donations are more, we have seen like, towards uh, pro bono, you know, just so you can look good also Absolutely. by supporting a, another country. And uh, 
and my colleagues in the, like uh, in marine biology and geology always uh, complain how how samples are shared and how samples are collected. Yeah, sometimes you don't really have lab equipment to analyze them locally, but you have this rich resource locally. And but ideally, this collaboration should end up in uh, papers where your name don't get added. And and the, these are quite common in many of like especially in, uh, in uh, geology, marine biology, where you have to collect samples and things. And uh, yeah, so in in terms of these sort of donations, uh, maybe Tana, like even setting up these research infrastructures and in, like I mean. In, African nation itself, there are many, not just in astronomy, other sciences, many infrastructures are being built because of the vast land availability. And uh, yeah, what's your experience in, in that so far? So that is the this issue of using unceded indigenous land, for instance, to build um, big science installations. Um, one that was very much in the news um, a few years ago was the uh, 30 meter telescope, the TMT that they're trying to build on Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And there's been loud uh, protests and pushback against the, uh, the building of this telescope by indigenous Hawaiians, because they, this is not the first telescope, of course, that would have been built there. And they feel that their community doesn't benefit from these big installations, that these are world-class telescopes being built and they are not seeing the sort of trickle down effects. Um, and then also um, some, some members of the community were also saying, you know, that Mauna Kea is actually a sacred site to us. And, um, and on the science side, we're saying, you know, science at all costs. And I am very much of the belief that there is no amount of science you can do, no level of science you can do um, that is worth trampling on people's rights. Um, you know, that there's no science you can do that will, that should be put above, uh, you know, the dignity and, uh, and humanity of certain groups of people or of anyone. Um, and so, so, I mean, that's a very high profile situation in South Africa with the square kilometer array and in Australia with the square kilometer array. The square kilometer array, just very quickly, is um, being built as a radio telescope a radio frequency telescope and when it is complete over the next few years it will be the world's biggest science experiment so way bigger than CERN um, or the Large Hadron Collider which is currently uh, the biggest uh, science experiment on the planet so we're building this incredible telescope on um, in both cases in South Africa and in Australia on indigenous land um, there's all this the new trend right now is to have land recognition um, statements and that's nice but it kind of harkens back to what you just said, uh, Tilina, about how we do stuff that makes us feel and look good. It's very good for photo op if you have some photos with some traditionally dressed indigenous people on their land, giving a thumbs up. But what does it actually mean for the local communities? Because one thing that is often the, the gap in thinking about indigenous peoples and indigenous knowledge systems um, and indigenous ways of knowing and interacting with the world is that these aren't ancient civilizations. These are modern, existing, still growing, still changing, um, active ways of doing things. And these, uh, these groups of people are alive right now and their culture is alive and their language is alive and their knowledge systems are alive. So it's not about, um, you know, th this isn't about this is about you know contemporary people who have the right to self determination, and that absolutely includes um, the the right to determine what happens to the land that people are on without their permission in most cases. And so we build these telescopes and we have these land acknowledgements. But for instance, in Australia, Australia doesn't have any formalized treaties with Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders. So they, so as astronomers, we have this little like you know paragraph where we say we thank you so much for letting us build here. We recognize your right to the land, but it doesn't go any further than that because there's no legal basis right now in which Aboriginal Australians and Torres Strait Islanders 
it's going to actually challenge your stay in state um, to do anything meaningful. And so we need to scratch just below the surface. And it actually brings me to something that I champion a lot and am very passionate about. And I want people to engage with more is this idea of just doing things that make us look and feel good versus doing actual evidence based interventions. And this is where, and this kind of touches on, there's another question here in the chat box where they ask, I'll just kind of quickly summarize it. They say, with critical and STEM scholars meaningfully engaging in science's role in the colonial project, with the latter being led by critical de uh, colonial scholars. So sorry, there's another part of the question. So they ask about successful case studies outside of science communication, where there's a practice of decolonial de science. And so I'll talk about this right at the end when we kind of wrap up as well, but especially for the hard, what we call the hard sciences, so physics and chemistry, stuff like that, there's a lot of hubris, there's a lot of arrogance that, you know, I study physics, so I'm better than everyone and I know everything, and we need to change that hubris to humility and actually reach out across campus to the humanities, to the social sciences, to the decolonial scholars who actually have made this their life's work. We can't know, my PhD is in counting photons. Um, I point the telescope and then I count the photons that come from this dead star, and then I write a paper about it. There are people who have devoted decades of their life to critically thinking about decolonial um, frameworks and how to implement them in society. And we as scientists need to practice humility in reaching out to them and saying, we can't do this on our own. These are our problems. How do we change them? Because you have the expertise. And equally, we must practice humility and reach out to the local people, the people who the land really belongs to, the indigenous peoples, and say, you know this land better than anyone. How do we, with your permission, use it in such a way that it benefits everyone, it benefits you in particular, and also supports our science goals? And that's, that dialogue needs to happen a lot more. And with the TMT, it was really brought to light in a very kind of, um, in a very, big flashy kind of way that that's, that dialogue is still not happening. And if it is happening, it's not, it's, you know, we're reaching a deadlock because it's indigenous people fighting for their self-determination and their humanity and the continuation of their way of life. And a bunch of scientists who only care about looking at stars. And there needs to be more, we need more support to be able to have meaningful um, and, you know, successful conversations that will move us forward. Yeah, and one of the interesting that sort of complaints or, or uh, this narrative is built because of TMP is that, or maybe we can actually take science out of everything, science as, as a context, you know, you, you, you see science as, as a natural phenomena and leave cultural context out of it. And, and because there were so many protests and, and um, requests for policy changes at TMT, it, it delayed in years and years, and which made a lot of people unhappy, like a lot of scientists unhappy because it delayed doing science. And, but, Yes, it delayed doing science, like it delayed building one of the biggest uh, telescopes that, uh, you know, should come be uh, available in, in few years. But I think in, in large spectrum of, of scale of years, this delay is tiny and, and it's a necessary delay. And I wouldn't consider, Absolutely. yeah, this few years of delaying and and also it's quite difficult. Um, I mean, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, looking science as a purely like a subject that we all uh, can look into is quite difficult because science itself is very much of, there's so much of cultural um, connection to it, how, how I learned science and how I understood science. And, yeah. And uh, and how I slowly realizing that I have been all, like only for Western science, 
and then uh, large portion of my education missing uh, any sciences that generated from my region. And uh, yeah, so there are, I think, a few other questions maybe I missed uh, in the chat, but okay, great. So the, so uh, the chat, sorry, the chat question was about like, you know, as I read out, but they specifically said it outside of science communication, but now as you work professionally in that area, can I ask you, how does the colonial uh, practices and frameworks, how do they impact the science outreach and the science communication and public engagement that we do? Because that is, I mean, science communication is how we justify what we do as scientists to the taxpayer, essentially. You know, we have, uh, you know, we get taxpayer money and it's our duty to show the work to the people who pay us ultimately. And um, the way we do that is probably also steeped in colonial practices. So if you'd like to speak on that. Yeah, it's also, uh, I think in maybe la like last decade, the this topic of science communication came into a job, became a job. And interestingly, it's happening right now for science policy. And quite a lot of science policy jobs are coming up in, at, at uh, these bigger institutions. And so it, it's a really interesting role how science communicators and, and now science policy, uh, policy uh, officers are uh, playing a part uh, on trying to sort of connect these hard science or whichever the sciences that we are learning and, and results, also failures. And, and you know, communicating both the success and failures are equally important uh, to, for the, for, for two, I, I see two reasons. One, it, helps to justify taxpayers' money, but that's how we also increase the scientific literacy in, in the society. And so far, the scientific literacy, the way we increase the scientific literacy is actually the school education. And that has been the basic measurement of science, you know, scientific increase in scientific literacy. And then, and then people are basically on their own, right? You have unlimited resources, but, as a as a society, it wouldn't really grow the the scientific literacy. So science communicators and and plays a bigger role in this. And and let me also touch base in science policies because uh, within last five years, many of the major research in infrastructures hired the science policy officers, like. Even um, I know one of my colleagues who was at my institution moved to Astron as a science, uh, the police officer uh, in Netherlands. And uh, so as science communicators are communicating the science with the public, but also, you know, bringing public opinion back to the scientists. Yeah. Because I, I always say that it's, it's not, a lot of the time we are looking at the receivers, like the audience, but we also need to look at how scientists see what is important, like what is outreach, what is education, and how do we, how do they, what are their inclusive, inclusive practices? And uh, we, there's been two studies done that I some sort of like for our, our group, colleague and friend, uh, Pedro Russo actually did a, uh, from Leiden University, uh, did a study on how astronomers view public outreach. And this is actually like how scientists basically view what's the importance of public outreach. But astronomy being such a fascinating subject for public, it turns out the study should like confirm what we always believe that astronomers are like actively engaged. And last year, with an uh, intern, I did the similar study for all of the field I'm, work, uh, I'm working at uh, in my institution, uh, how scientists look at origin of life uh, 
doing like doing outreach and education to origin of life. And interestingly, it's uh, almost the opposite of how astronomers will communicate in the South research with public. And it's the, the, the about a hundred uh, about a hundred researchers being uh, surveyed. Uh, turns out that everyone thinks it's too complex for the public and so on, and, and it's not a, not so much of a good use of money for outreach. So, and uh, policymakers are are key here as well because policymakers helps really to change things that we discuss, like changing, you know, making sure that uh, the, for example, salaries and you know when you are doing a project. Uh, when you're writing project and pro especially these international collaborations are involved like local expertise and how, how the funding is allocated and looking into like local policies and also and, and they come with really different set of uh, skills so I think the really not everyone has the resources but a really well coil machine would be to have a scientist science communicator science policy maker you know all in one room, whenever you plan like a larger or a small project. And, uh, but even without these resources, you still are able to sort of reach out to other experts to build things. Uh, and that's sort of like how I see the, these, like how science, the role of a science communicator and science policy maker officer. So the kind of, so you've talked from your kind of, well, you know more about science policy really than I do. The scientific community itself in response to decolonization just talks um, has been in my experience uh, very negative. Scientists don't want to really engage with it. My last talk on decolonization resulted in uh, loud racist vitriol being spewed at me. Um, that video is on YouTube if you wanna watch it. Um, and so I've also given uh, a talk about decolonization of science, very specifically in the South African astronomy context, um, to the to the general South African astronomy community. And I have, and that was two years ago, and I've had no follow up from anyone, just crickets. So they're not really willing to engage at this stage. Um, the vibe right now, the tiny thing is equity, diversity, and inclusion, right? Or whatever combination of letters and buzzwords, because um, some people have equality, diversity, and inclusion. Some people leave diversity out or you or you put in belonging in there somewhere. That's the, the, the vibe at the moment. And they're not yet ready to take that step to, um, to engage with decolonization because of course those things are very different. They, they're overlapping, and, but they're not exactly the same thing. And so, um, yeah, there's this big pushback, not everywhere. I saw some excellent work being done by, for instance, the University of York in the UK, their science, uh, their chemistry department is trying really hard. They've written papers about this and in practice um, and on social media, they show you know how they, they try to put the context back into their science. So the, the easiest way to get away with not changing anything is to strip the cultural context or the historical context away from, from science results. And they show quite like, you know, how you can simply by putting the cultural and historical context back into your science results it really opens up um it opens up discussion it opens up your understanding of how science is implemented who it impacts who gets to do it and also it uh, you know it helps with this issue of erasure because a lot of um a lot of the issues that we um have with um, with science is you know who gets to do it and who gets credit for it as we mentioned earlier as well um, there's you know there's a lot of erasure of um, of the work that um, and knowledge that is held by non-traditional scientists so basically women people of margin or other people of marginalized genders indigenous people people of color um, all around the world and your work gets stolen, outright stolen, or you just don't get the recognition or you don't get the funding and you can't continue. And this is all part and parcel of a colonized framework of how to do science. So breaking free from that can be seen as threatening to some people. And so in general, we are the work, some people are really putting in the work, but in um, overall, um, there's a, a big reluctance to get actively involved.
Yeah. Um, I think I my experience also very similar to you where it hasn't been positive in science policy uh, changes. Uh, in in fact, uh, overall, um, I, I don't know, Tana, if you share the uh, notion that uh, somehow the large majority reaction to decolonizing science has been negative. Yeah. Uh, and I think it comes from also that everything happened uh, during the colonial period happened many years ago. And the people who are living today are not directly, you know, they are not the responsible parties, but they have, they can take actions uh, to move in that forward. And there's always that notion I have seen, not, not just for science, but anything else, like for example, uh, many of these, uh, my favorite thing, one of my favorite things to do is to go to some of these national museums and see all these uh, artifacts that are stolen from other countries. And uh, you have to pay to see your own cultural artifacts in another country, yeah. and that's actually very galling. Yeah. And uh, so it's th this kind of, and when you point this out, it's almost like touching somebody's nerve. And uh, so it, it's all also in, in science that I see that quite often. Uh, yeah. yeah, definitely. There's, there is a, a refusal to, so they, the, the idea is that you distance yourself, right? They say, well, that happened in the 1700s and stopped in the 1800s and that's not my fault. So there's this idea that they are, because they're not the perpetrators, um, it's not the issue, but they don't, people don't want to engage with the fact that they very much are still actively the beneficiaries. And people need to, you know, you need to acknowledge that you are the beneficiaries of a system that was set up hundreds of years ago, but it still absolutely benefits you to this day. Something as simple as who needs a visa to go to a certain country and who doesn't, and how that, those kind of challenges, those logistical challenges, and how they, why they were set up, um, how that impacts your ability to do science. Because every conference, every um, Northern Hemisphere conference season, we see on social media and in, um, on other platforms, scientists from Africa, for instance, complaining that you know I'm a keynote speaker, I'm an invited speaker, or this is my first opportunity to talk about this amazing science result, and I didn't get the visa. Um, and so they, you know, there's a lot of layers to this um, and the lasting impact needs to be acknowledged. And those who are the beneficiaries, beneficiaries need to be honest with themselves as well and acknowledge, um, you know, the, the benefits that they still receive to this day. You weren't there when it was implemented, but you're not doing anything right now to, to balance the scales. And so that's, you know, and that, and that does touch a nerve with people because everyone also, this other myth of science is that it's a meritocracy. It's not, um, but you know, you scientists cling to that because it also makes you feel special. And so there's a lot of psychology as well behind this, of course, just giving people facts isn't enough. There's a paper that came out recently that shows, for instance, that male scientists are less don't believe the data when you talk about, for instance, gender gender issues in science and how being someone from a marginalized gender um, has a negative impact on your ability to do science. And male scientists don't believe that data. And so giving people data is not enough. We need to think about the psychology behind this as well. Yeah, and uh, let me connect that uh, some of your thoughts into the lab. The question we received, and I'll read out the question. The social study of science often differentiate between four, for example, EU and US, uh, periphery example, low income countries and semi-periphery, which is uh, uh, emerging example, emerging economies. So these, what role do we see for the latter in the decolonizing science, for, for example, these emerging uh, yeah. economies. 
and let me uh, uh, call it then, Anna. Yeah. And yeah, so interestingly, uh, I, I think look, we, the, it's, it's sort of a mistake uh, that if we focus decolonizing science on just on the global north or the Western countries, it has to be, it has to happen from like from all parties. And uh, because we have to understand just because you come from a, either a low income or emerging income or, or like mm -hmm. one of the colonized countries, you are not by default aware of these practice, deep, like colonial practices. It, it, takes a, it takes a bit more effort to understand how things are because and also at some time, at, at certain instances, you are not even aware some of the scientific practices done in your nation by others, right? You, you don't know what's going on, even though it's your expertise. And, uh, and at the same time, I, as I mentioned, like during, during this discussion, the lack of resources and lack of funding forces people to sort of reach out to things that they are given. And, and, and negotiations are sort of lacking on these matters, like because, because we are at this position of lack of resources and, and lack of opportunities. So whatever is given is sort of seen as this golden ticket and, and you know, something that we appreciate and, and try to take the best of it out of it. And uh, it, it's really uh, in that context that we need to make sure that awareness has to come from all parties, not, not just the uh, party from, from Global North or Western, but also from yeah. Uh, yeah. our end, like from, yeah. So I would say that the uh, kind of what role do the different parties, the different stakeholders, um, given the, the power imbalance play, everyone plays, must play a role, but the roles will be slightly different. So we we quick to say, oh, you know, um, under-resourced countries or low-income countries don't have the resources, but the main resource that we do have or middle-income countries is our geographic advantage in astronomy for instance the science isn't going to happen if if we don't allow you to come build your, your stuff on indigenous land so we have that massive we, we must be brave and our politicians need to stand up and say you can't you know you can build your stuff here but these are this is what we want and this and they need to come with what we call you know the smart goals measurable achievable time bound in the next five years if we don't see xyz then we're going to stop your building um, and i think that's entirely reasonable and then on the flip side, again, um, for the countries in the global north, um, again, coming back to that concept of they need to start taking the first steps and realize the, you know, that they are the beneficiaries of an unequal system. And it's only by honestly name, acknowledging that you have a problem and naming what their problem is, can you start to solve the problem. And so we need some honesty on one side and some gumption on the other side and constant collaborative talks and everyone needs to have a voice because we're all involved in this because science is for everyone. Um, the world belongs to everyone and not just in astronomy context, in all kinds of contexts, in um, environmental and life sciences. There's a lot of work, you know, where people come in um, and you can only do certain kinds of research in certain places because that's where the interesting flora or fauna are, that's where the certain combination of natural occurrences are. And so, those countries need to start gate, gatekeeping in a lot of ways and saying we're tired of being exploited if you want to work with us th these are our lists of demands these are our you know these are goals and we can work it together for instance the uh, the sand people of South Africa one of the indigenous South African groups of people they have a um, they have documentation and um, guidelines uh, uh, for how you, if you want to come and study their language, their culture, or beyond their land, etc., um, as a scientist outside of their community, 
they only allow a certain, um, a certain way of questioning and a certain line of questioning um, and investigation that benefits their people and their culture and their land. So you can't just come into sand, into the sand community in South Africa and you know, want to do a whole bunch of stuff and learn a whole bunch of stuff um, if it doesn't benefit them. And they're very strict on that. And um, other indigenous groups are also interested in adopting that because that's their, you know, their right as um, you know, people with the right to self-determination. They said, we know the world is massively fascinated with us. And, but if you want to come and learn about us, and then about what we do, who we are as people, you have to put our humanity first and foremost. And one of the ways you're going to do that is none of the work that you're going to do can be done without an obvious and direct benefit to our community. And this is how we define benefits. And so you either engage like this or you get nothing from us. And I think that is really powerful. Um, I am in awe of the, you know, of the, uh, of the strength and I love that they're standing up for themselves in that way, despite the fact that they are so disenfranchised in so many different ways. Um, and I think that, you know, we can learn a lot more by trying to kind of engage with that intellectually and also embody that same kind of self-determination. Yeah, indeed. Um, and you, you mentioned actually, science, you know, seeing science, uh, uh, as a uh, as a contextual uh, way also, which uh, let me also connect that to this question we just came in, and I'll read it out for everybody. Mm -hmm. And uh, is it possible to decolonize science while science is still figured as a property that can be owned, controlled, bought, sold, stolen, <coughs> etc. Is the idea of science and property connected at a fundamental level to colonialism in science? In a broader sense, can capitalism being rooted in property, for example, coexist with science in a decolonized context? Um, that is, yeah, that's a, an amazing question and not the first time um, that's been brought up. Uh, yeah. the, the kind of interconnectedness of capitalism, of white supremacy, of colonization, of the patriarchy, and how if in a truly equal and just world, we have to dismantle all of these, you know, it's a hydra, you have to take down all of these things. And the kind of science as a very extractive process is very much aligned with capitalism, right? Because we know again the, the thing about and, and politics as well there's some, certain science is funded because it's beneficial because you can or you, you can make money from it or you can strengthen your you know your country's um defense or military especially with uh, physics and astronomy there's actually very close ties to military industrial complex as well so these are all the kind of things that we need to take into account when you talk about decolonization it's not it's not just one thing on its own. It's not siloed like that. Some people try to silo it. It needs to be holistic and inclusive and we need to tackle, you know, we need to dismantle all these things because they all do go together. They all very much linked and, um, you know, build each other up in the strength. And so when we talk about a decolonial framework, we're also talking about it ultimately an anti-capitalist framework, an anti-patriarchal framework. Um, you know, um, an anti-racist framework. All of these things need to be there together to get this actually right. And um, and so, yeah, um, as they say as well, the rest of the question, they say maybe it's just the first step. Um, you know, we're, there's no one way to do this and we're not going to get this right. There's going to be a lot of false starts. There's going to be a lot of learning as we go, but we also need to recognize on the kind of, on the, the bigger picture, how the systems of oppression and systems that uphold um, and just practices and outcomes in this world, how they are connected, how we have to dismantle them all at the same time if we're going to really get this right. Indeed. Um, we, I want to sort of head into a wrapping up mm -hmm. in the next uh, 10, 10 minutes or so. Yeah. And, and also if any, anyone has more questions, we'll, we'll try to sort of uh, bring them in uh, also. Yeah. 
from yeah sorry we have been focused on all this chat online uh completely ignore them from here yes um, i'll try to speak loud yeah yeah um so all of this is happening thinking about not only like funding for their business but also like Funding with you. My question is a little bit to do with that. Um, last um, spring, no, not last spring, like a few months ago, I was in Nairobi and I was working with a human rights legal aid organization for refugees. And they sort of gave me everything that was like, here's the budget, here's the um, like the grants. Like, you're the only one that understands this sort of like Western language and this Western sort of thinking of like, I have to write and answer these questions in this certain way or else I won't get funding. And one thing that really stood out was one of the grants that was given to them was by the US government on um, an application. And in the application, it said like you must include LGBTQ plus persons in your work. And so when they saw that, um, they were like, in Kenyan culture, if we do this and we include um, this specific group and we like make sure that we programs we won't be able to run our other programs because we'll be blacklisted because that marginalized group isn't accepted. And so they actually decided not to even pursue the funding opportunity mm -hmm. because the, like I would say, grant maker didn't take into consideration like the like cultural sensitivity on the ground and what's accepted and what's not. Um, so my question is, are funders doing this because they just, don't know, but you're not culturally sensitive, or is it like a performative way to like include marginalized groups and say like we're ahead of you, like you should be accepting these marginalized groups and like um like we're trying to like push that onto them or like how do you see it? Um, um, if if I may, sure. Terrible echo. Terrible echo. Oh, sorry. On my side. Sorry. Um, so this is a very interesting point, especially on the specific issue of LGBTQI plus rights um, and issues around that. Um, so you you asked, you know, is it are the funders doing this because they don't know, or are they doing this because it's a, a seemingly easy way to include marginalized people, um, and you know, and also a way to kind of virtue signal that they are more advanced. Um, on social issues, it's it's a combination of both. It's definitely a com I think it's a combination of both. I also very specifically, like I said, on the LGBTQIA plus aspect, that is very much a hangover of colonialism. Um, the uh, homophobia and all the other, you know, as an umbrella term for any kind of discrimination or bigotry towards LGBTQIA plus community of which I am a part, is uh, was introduced by Europeans coming to Africa or to South America or to the Americas, um, Asia, etc. Where you know, just leaving Europe, they brought religion, they brought the Bible, they brought the um, understanding of what is and is not acceptable behavior, and um, homophobia was absolutely part of that. So um, it's very interesting now. So the idea that you know. The global north is somehow further along on this issue is very much ignoring the fact that that issue exists in the first place in the rest of the world because they introduced it to us so um so that's so the lack of cultural sensitivity is also a lack of grappling with the past and and this is why i keep saying you know they mean people need to acknowledge the harm done by colonialism they need to acknowledge that they're beneficiaries of uh, the ongoing system because colonialism is not in the past colonization is not in the past in a meaningful sense and um and so them trying to force through their issues is a disregard for the local cultural context but also um very much a problem that they brought to that local cultural context yeah it, uh, and also let me add uh with regards to you know people preparing funding calls and and definitely uh, I, I'm, I'm part of a few different uh, funding review committees and a lot of the so a lot of the times if the funding is global or like bilateral reviewers tend to come from many different because you are almost trying to find reviewers from 
different expertise and, and with different background. But reviewers themselves do not write the grant application. An application is almost coming from this, the funding institution or the funding body, and which has, in my experiences, which lacks uh, the local circumstances, societal and cultural awareness, and uh, and very unfortunately, so the reviewers tend to give feedback. It, it's all almost you know there's there's no win in some of these situations where. Every year, the same proposal goes out, and then reviewers provide the comments to both parties. You know, this is how you need to do, and for the the applicant and also for the uh, funder. And but almost all the time, the the upgrade of the applications are very very slow or very minor. And in one of the funding uh, agencies that I'm involved, if you look at uh, the proposals from 10 years ago and then now, it has changed vastly, but also a lot of the times to benefit the, the funder itself, like it's more about like, how can you implement our agenda? And that's why these global agendas are actually built in a way without considering local context. And it's important, and that's why any agenda, any like requirement, if that could be flexible, that you you address in in very much of a localized way. So each somebody applying for the same grant from like two different countries are completely different. And it's not the project that's different, it's the approach and what, what you're achieving. And uh, and that's, but I also understand when you do that, for the funder, it becomes really hard to just, you know, numerically justify it because you it becomes harder to build a survey that equally, and I think that's one of the reasons that SDGs are so popular because they're very, very vague and people can adopt, but also very hard to measure because there's no like a uniform measurement how the SDGs are achieved. But I think rather than also, we had to, I would push rather than trying to fulfill a report and, and fulfill, you know, numbers, if we, contextually see different grants and different achievements, it, that adds more value to the, the sciences and the society and so on. And so a lot of the time, it's unfortunately the funding agency itself that this, how the grant proposal the applications are rather put together. Um, yeah, so maybe Tana, we could uh, start wrapping up. Yep. I kind of want to leave every everyone with a couple of thoughts, uh, especially uh, I assume like our audience and, and people who are listening live and people who are going to listen later um, are some way related to uh, academia and uh, or maybe have like a, they have an interest in, in science academia. And what are the I want to sort of like go through what are the some of the basic actions and steps scientists and experts can do, but from both like all parties, not just from the global north or the or the western countries, but also from global south and then uh, in colonized countries and developing world. Um, yeah, do you have any um, some thoughts on this matter? I, I will also add a couple of things. Uh, yeah, again, just to thank everyone for tuning in. I hope that our discussion sparks further discussions um, and even just some self-reflection in and of yourself. I always learn so much when I participate in talks where I'm ostensibly the expert. So this has been really, really great. Thank you again for inviting me. 
And um, I'll just reiterate uh, my main point that I like to give to scientists, for those of you who are in the sciences, especially the hard sciences, let go of the hubris and replace it with humility. Talk to other experts, um, especially outside of your field, especially in the humanities. They can help us so much and their work is just as valuable as our work. And also to remember that the science that we do must always be connected to, you know, we mustn't lose sight of what we're doing as scientists and how it impacts society, how it impacts people. Because um, when we start to lose sight of that, we start to, you know, use science in a way that is harmful and to be brave, to be brave and challenge yourself, challenge your thinking, evaluate your value systems and beliefs. And don't be, don't be afraid, but to be brave and engage with uh, decolonial thoughts, practices, people. Um, and also just to say very practically that social media is a great way to get involved with this. That's where I um, have learned a lot and been put in contact with people who have really helped me along with this. And um, yeah, just to yeah, be brave, be humble. And um, especially to scientists, you know, we're, we're supposed to be lifelong learners. So make this something else that you educate yourself on as well. Okay, and let me add to that. Uh, so um, my, what I would recommend uh, for all, all different parties that you, especially we are thinking, we are discussing about changing certain workflows changing how we do things and we should not expect like immediate result and and it, these things might not happen for you even though you might be the person who's actually heavily affected by uh, these colonial practices and, and think all this like long term that somebody after you can be benefited and even a small step like uh, uh, a funding agents are requesting funding agency to change the way they write the uh, application might not happen from your email, but at least in, it's in somebody's mind from that agency and down the line, when more people start actually voicing that, that change will ha might happen eventually. And, uh, and then it's, uh, so I think just like any other scientific research that we do, which is like long-term, if you look at space missions, it's like 10, 20 years. And even decolonizing science is something that take, it's going to take such a long time. So, but every small step makes a, goes a long way. And, uh, and the reason we are doing this now, we have, we, we have this notion of or doing science, it's for the society, it's for everybody's knowledge. So decolonizing science is actually also for everyone's benefit. Like so many others will benefit from your actions and it will open doors for many other people and, and also benefit many other nations as well. And uh, so I would, I would my, my recommendation is to start small, like at grassroots level, like talk to your colleagues and, you know, talk to us and because we also want to learn as much as possible and uh, and start from there. And uh, yeah, maybe um, going forward from here, like, okay, so we, we had this about two, more than two hours of, you know, discussion, how do we move forward from there? Um, I don't know if you have Tana something that you, you haven't even shared with me like a future plan. Uh, that one something I'm really keen on doing is that uh, that try to bring uh, at least from from the like two two different things that one from uh, people from ast scientists from astronomy and social scientists together for a symposium. I would that love that. That would be awesome. Yeah, we could. Yeah, we could organize at some point. Because uh, to learn these, we need really need social scientists. 
Yeah. There are the key that yeah, we're not gonna we're way. not gonna solve this problem on our own and we'd be wasting time reinventing the wheel. Um yeah. the people who have the 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 required, relevant, and appropriate knowledge already exists. So we need to just exactly. start talking to them. Yeah. And so hopefully we'll find a way that we can actually bring both parties together. Mm -hmm. And and on on a different note, also uh, to bring science communicators from different different sites together, because science communication is also key for to communicate these actively, and they have the skills to do that. They have the skills to really reach out to bring these even two parties together, and. Uh, so hopefully we'll, I, I, the two things I kind of want to move forward is bringing uh, scientists uh, uh, from astronomy or, or other sciences and, and uh, social science together and also, and then science communicators together. And, and if every, anyone interested in, you know, moving this forward, and I saw that there were quite a lot of people even yesterday at another panel, uh, discussing these topics and maybe we can work together because we do need people and we do need people to also learn from each other. So feel free to reach out to me or Tana at any any point. Yeah. We're happy to get connected and learn from you and learn your Absolutely, experience yeah. and so on. Great. Um, so thank you so much, Tana, for joining and uh, and you for your time and your sharing your knowledge and experience and everything you've learned so far and uh, and good luck with your uh, next like future especially with your position i'm super excited that you have this position in the netherlands that you can make a change and uh, and thank you everyone for joining uh, live and uh, from new york and also from online and, and thank you everyone who's going to watch this later on YouTube yeah. or wherever you are. So, uh, and lastly, thank you to OIS team and, and especially to Heather for bringing everything together. Uh, I know this was such a lot of work for all of you. So thank you for making this happen. All right, thank you so much. Thank you so much everyone for your time. And I look forward to hearing from you. Bye, everyone.